What Was That Like? contains adult language and content and is not intended for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to What Was That Like? I'm your host, Scott Johnson. This is a show where we talk to regular people, people just like you or just like me, who have found themselves in an extremely unusual situation. We'll hear their stories and get inside their head because we all want to know, what was that like? More information about each episode at whatwasthatlike.com. Here we go. What if you kind of knew someone in high school, then you became friends with that person when you both ended up at the same college? What if you started hanging out with that person and talking with them most days before or after classes? What if you confided in this person and came to really appreciate the friendship that was growing? Then, what if you started to realize that this person was not at all the person you thought they were? That's what happened to Marina, and it was a pretty scary time, not just for her, but for her unborn baby. She's just now starting to be able to tell this story out loud. As you listen to Marina, ask yourself a question. Is this podcast worth supporting? If you get any value from this episode or any of the other incredible stories that my guests tell on this show, I would really appreciate it if you'd consider supporting the show through my Patreon. You can do that at whatwasthatlike.com forward slash support. And now, here's Marina. When this happened, can you describe how scared you were? Yeah, I think definitely the scariest part for me was, I'm going to have to definitely say when I um, first realized that he was in my house and that it was not a welcome sight for anybody. He had been over before, but um, just the unexpectedness of it and it happening so quick was definitely the most heart pounding, I think. Well, let's learn. I want to learn about this guy. Now, sure. his his name is Brian, right? Yes, his name is Brian. And you first met him in high school. Yeah, I went to um, a high school that was pretty big, and in my class alone, there was um, there were three Brians, and so we just differentiated them by the last initials. But he was definitely of the three Brians. He was the quietest of them, and the one that I probably interacted with the least. But um, he did sit behind me at some point in like AP government or something like that. But again, very little interaction in high school. I don't remember hardly anything about him. To be honest, in high school, uh, most of the interaction came when I ran into him in college. Which is kind of, it seems like a kind of a coincidence, but was this a local college that you both yeah, went to? Uh, yeah, it, it's a college in my hometown. Um, so it's not that unusual. It's not that unusual because I think a lot of people ended up there, but... He was just like one of those people who I knew he was really bright and really smart. And so just uh, it's kind of weird just running into him there. I thought he would be on to bigger and better and <laughs> things like that. Um, but I ran into him coming. Actually, he was coming out of a hallway as I was going into it. I think I literally ran into him because I was so buried in my phone. And so I guess he had a class there right before I did. And I would see him pretty much every day going into that hallway. Now, whether he was there every day for that same class or if he just started showing up there, I'm not sure. But I did see him almost every day in that hallway. That's part of what I was wondering about is you kind of know what happened later and look back on how you happened to run into him sometimes. If that was, if you think maybe that was coincidence or if it was planned on his Ooh, I I want to hope that it was just a coincidence. I really do. Um, I lived on campus at that time, so I was always running late to my classes. <laughs> so I want to hope that it was a coincidence, but whether or not it actually was or if it was a planned thing is a little bit terrifying to think about. Actually, I haven't even thought about that until <laughs> right now, so <laughs> that's a little bit scary. So you you met him again, and knowing that you knew him before, but you didn't really know him that well. Yeah. How did that develop from that point? It just kind of started, like we would stand outside and talk because like, I was already late, so I would just like, eh, what's an extra five minutes? I would just stand out there and start talking to him. And as time went by, 
gave him my phone number eventually. And then, you know, start hanging out after class, go get a coffee on campus, you know, meet me in the library. I'm going to be studying, things like that. Um, and just kind of developed from there to the point where we were actually hanging out um, most days just outside of school. But during this time, you were actually dating someone else, right? Yeah, I was. I was um, working as a waitress and I was actually dating one of my customers, but um, everybody knew about it. So I didn't think much of it. I didn't think I needed to constantly be reminding him that I was dating someone or anything like that. I just um, went through the motions with that and kept the two separate. Did you get any kind of impression that he wanted more than just being friends and hanging out? Um, and not from like his actions or anything, but he definitely had told me on a few occasions that, you know, um, he remembered me from high school and, um, all, all these feelings he had for me in high school and blah, 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 blah. So he kind of had told me, but in the way he was telling me, it was almost like, oh, well, I used to, you know, you were my high school crush. You were not so much like, oh, this is what I want now. This is how I feel about you now. It was more like past tense. This is how I felt. And then eventually, I don't know, after maybe six months or so, it came. Now I still have these feelings for you, et cetera. And I was like, Ooh, pump the brakes, please. So what did you do about that when he told you? Um, I just kind of kept him at bay for a little bit. And then I finally, like, I wasn't really sure what to do at first. Um, I had kind of been in that situation before, but not with someone who I'd been so close with, who knew so much about me at that point, who, you know, I would go to with my problems that I was having in my relationship and get advice and things like that. Um, so I definitely had to sit him down and just tell him explicitly, like, you know, I see you as a friend and as a brother. I don't think I could ever see you in that way, um, but I don't want us to not be friends. And so I, I kept him at bay. I tried not to get his hopes too high that it would go anywhere farther than that, but maybe I just didn't do a great job. <laughs> but um, I definitely tried to make it clear that, you know, at the time I was already dating someone and I was invested in that relationship and valued his friendship. And you were invested in the other relationship because you got pregnant, right? Or yeah. that was part of it? Yeah, I actually, uh, I got pregnant fairly quickly into that relationship, but we had decided together that, you know, we were going to keep the baby, um, raise the baby, and just try to work on it. Whether our relationship ended up lasting or not, we wanted to do it for our child one way or the other. So I knew I was always going to have a relationship with that person. And then that's kind of what started it all. So Right. So when you, when you became pregnant, and obviously you were involved with that relationship, and Brian knew that it wasn't going to go anywhere. Is that when things started to get kind of weird? Yeah, definitely. I think, I think he felt I was hiding it from him, which was a, not my intention and B, not what I was doing. I never intentionally meant to make him feel that way or make him feel like he was in the dark about it. But in my mind, I was so young, but it wasn't any of his business for the, to be blatantly honest. He didn't need to know anything about it. He didn't have to know anything about it. It wasn't his kid. If he was the father, then it would have been a completely different story, but he wasn't. And he didn't know who my boyfriend was at that time. He didn't know who his father was. He didn't know how involved he was or how involved he wanted to be. He got upset because, you know, I told some of my really close friends from like from when I was in kindergarten before I told him. And so I think in me doing all that, in his mind, it just felt like maybe I was pushing him completely out, which I wasn't. I was going to tell him, obviously, eventually, but I just had other priorities and other people to think of first. My family, my very close friends, obviously the baby's father. I had to think of all those people first before him. I mean, he was a fairly new friend, so I didn't go screaming it to the world before I told him, but he wasn't very happy that he wasn't first on the list, I think, to find out. And how did it come out, or how did you figure out that he wasn't too happy. He definitely got more um, moody and snippy with me. If I had to go to doctor's appointments and, you know, we wouldn't be able to hang out, then he would text me just kind of some nasty things. I just kind of remember general things um, about how I don't care about him anymore and how how I can be putting this other guy above him when we've been such good friends. And it's like, but it's not about that. It's It's about the baby at the end of the day. Like I said, he doesn't He's not involved in the baby's life. He's not the father. You don't need to be at my doctor's appointments. I don't need you to take me to my doctor's appointments. I'm capable of getting there on my own. 
He wanted to take you to those appointments? Yeah, that's when it, that's like the first kind of red flaggy things. He would want to go with me to those appointments. He would want to buy me things for the baby and for the nursery. And I was like, I'm only a couple months pregnant at this point. It was just so overwhelming. I remember that being so overwhelming because I wasn't even ready to think about any of those things yet. I was still wrapping my head around the fact that I was pregnant in the first place and what I was going to do about that and how I was going to manage that. But yeah, he definitely tried to put himself in situations where he didn't necessarily need to be interjecting um, himself. And, and how old were you at this time? I was 21, 21 or 22. I think I was 22 because I turned 23 just after I had my son. So I was 22. Mm-hmm. So I was fairly young. How else did he start annoying you? Annoying might be a mild word, <laughs> but... <laughs> It would start with uh, him just kind of popping up at the house, which was okay for a little bit at the beginning. Um, He had been hanging out at my house before. Usually it was by invite, but he would just pop up if he knew I was there. And then it started getting really weird. He would start showing up at my house very late at night. Um, He drove a motorcycle. Did you live by yourself at that time? Um, I actually didn't. I had actually just moved back in with my parents to kind of get my head around everything. Everything was so overwhelming at that point where it was like, I don't think I can handle being out on my own right now, dealing with roommates, dealing with X, Y, and Z bills. I just need to get somewhere where I know I'm safe, where I know my child is safe, where my pregnancy can go smoothly, and then I'll just commute back and forth to school, which is what I did. So he would start showing up. It was actually my parents' house that he would show show up out. At, up in front of and I would hear the motorcycle engine sitting outside my house I'd look out the window and I could see his helmet I just remember vividly seeing his helmet he had a a blacked out whatever that's called visor on it that would that the street lights would reflect off of and I could see him sitting out there and I'd get text messages where saying well I know you're home I can see your light I can see the light from your phone I know you're there why aren't you answering why aren't you coming outside Things like that, which was really, really creepy, especially coming from someone who, who at the time I didn't have any reason to feel like I needed to worry about. So it was. <laughs> but that started to kind of let you know something is up. Yeah, they definitely started thinking that something was up at that point. And then after some of the motorcycle incidences, I started getting um, phone calls from unknown numbers block numbers, no name phone numbers, uh, every day, all day. And I could not understand what was happening. At first it wasn't that bad. At first it was like maybe once an hour for the whole day. And it started to escalate more and more and more until one night I had to turn off my phone because it was ringing so much, turned it back up the next morning. And I vividly remember the number that was on that screen, 410 missed calls from an, the same unknown number, 410, which was like the most unnerving sight to see. It's just, it's burned in my mind. So He literally just stayed up all night dialing your number. Yeah. And I found out later that it actually wasn't even him. He had gotten one of his friends to sit up all night dialing my number. Yeah. It was literally the most unnerving thing I've ever seen. I'll never pick up a phone number that I don't know ever again. Any block calls I ignore. When those calls first started coming in, did you answer them in the beginning? In the beginning, I would answer them. um, And I can remember the silence on the other side. It wasn't ever like a dial tone. There was never any buzzing. It was just silence and then a click. So so you could tell the the call got completed. You Mm -hmm. were connected with someone. They just weren't saying anything. They weren't saying anything. I remember hearing the click every time I picked it up. And so eventually I just started ignoring it. Um, I would say back sometimes it'd be like, hello, hello, who is this? And I would get nothing back in return, not even a breathing. I don't know how, but it didn't even sound like they were breathing, whoever was on the other line. And then I had, I was out with a friend one day and I had him pick up the the phone and he just yelled into the phone, you better stop calling. And that seemed to ebb it for a little bit, for maybe an hour or so. And then it started again. It was definitely unnerving. That was 
Oof. That's got to be the creepiest thing to. Yeah, it gives me chills thinking about it now. To know somebody's out there calling you over and over again and. Over and over. Yeah. And no matter what I did, no matter how many times I told them to stop calling, to, to leave me alone, it just kept going. But that night, definitely the 410 calls was that. And that was after I had had my phone on for a while before I'd gone to sleep. Right. So there was even more than that. Getting bombarded. Yeah. yeah. But that was just the notification number when I turned on my phone. And I just, I can remember it so vividly. Yeah, it still gives me chills thinking about it. Can you talk about the day that he actually showed up in your house? Yeah. So the day he showed up in my house, I had woken up pretty late. I was supposed to be going to school that day. I had woken up for my 9 o'clock class at 930 Um, But I hadn't really been feeling well anyways when I had gone to bed the night before. Um, And when I woke up, I was still feeling kind of queasy, had a little bit of a headache. I chalked it up to my pregnancy. I just wasn't going to push myself that day. So I got up and I went to my restroom, which is located outside of my bedroom. And I did my regular morning routine, um, took a shower, brushed my teeth, went to the restroom. Um, I went downstairs and got a glass of water and came back upstairs. And when I came back uh, and turned the corner into my room, I saw him standing there. He was in your room. He was in my room, which was really, really scary uh, to say the least. My, I, my heart was pounding out of my chest. Uh, luckily I had not grabbed a glass cup because when I dropped it, it would have shattered. But just by per- pure chance I had grabbed uh, like a plastic cup, but I can hear it hitting the floor still. I don't know. I like to think that maybe somehow he got in when I was taking a shower. Part of me is terrified to think that maybe he was in my room the whole night because I had not been home the night before I had been at school. Where could, how could he have been in your room without you knowing? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if he was in my closet. I don't know if he was under my bed. There's a, there were a lot of nooks and crannies in that room. A lot of places to not make noise that I hid from my parents in when I was younger. Sometimes if I was mad or just needed to get away. So you come around the corner and make eye contact with him standing there. What do you, do either one of you say anything? Neither of us say anything. I can remember how heavy the room felt when I walked in. I can remember the, the eerie silence when I walked in and he's just staring at me. And the look on his face, I've never seen before. And I have never seen it in a person since. The look in his eyes. What did, what did that look tell you? What, did you? what was it like? It told me to run. I, I felt like I had been punched with a ton of bricks when I, saw, when I came around that corner and saw him standing there. I felt so betrayed. I felt so vulnerable. Um, It like it hurts my heart thinking about it right now, coming from someone who was such a good friend at the beginning. Sorry. Um, my feet just took over and I turned really, really fast. I was a dancer at that point in my life, so I turned extremely quickly and started to run. Um, but he was just that much quicker than me, and he grabbed me, um, and he dragged me back into my room. And he slammed me up against, there's a, there was a bookcase right up uh, inside the door and slammed me against the bookcase and told me that there was only one way it was going to stop. And that was if, um, if I went to everybody and called everybody and went on my Facebook declaring that, um, he was the father of my child, um, and that it was his kid and that he was the one who was going to be there. And I mustered up every inch of saliva I had in my mouth and spit it in his face and told him no. And then at that point, he, the way the room was set up was the door and the bookcase was here. My bed was right up against this wall. And he threw me across the room onto the bed and jumped on me and pinned me down. He had both his fist on my wrists and his knees pressed into my legs. My phone had been right on my bedstand, and I heard it hit the ground. And my first instinct was reach for it. Go for it. You have to get help. You have to get out of here. 
So as I reach for it, I feel him tugging at my shirt that I had on, trying to rip it off, trying to pull everything down that he could uh, to violate me, to embarrass me, to do whatever his intentions were at that moment. Somehow, I don't know how I managed to wriggle free from him, which is very hard to do in a bed that suppresses down. But somehow I managed to wriggle away from him. I grabbed my phone and flipped onto my feet. And as I did that, as I was raising my phone, I remember the hand hitting hitting my hand and the phone flying across the room. And then it was um, then it was a race for the phone. So I turned, started running for it. He runs for it too. Uh, he gets there first and slams his foot down on top of it. As he does, I push him off and I pull the phone out from under his foot and he slaps out it again. So I figured that wasn't going to be an option at that point and I heard him hiss again if you want to stop you know how and again I said no and I pushed my way past him towards the door and just ran and my bedroom is at the top of um, a one-story flight of stairs but it has two landings on it so it curves around the corner so I got down to the first down the first landing into the second one and that's when I felt um that's when I felt his hand grab my ponytail and pull me back. It turned me around and he put his hands on my neck and he held me over the staircase. And again, he said, the only way. He said, the only way it's going to stop is if you do what I say. And I told him, no, I wasn't going to do it. And the next thing I remember was the grip letting go. And I heard myself scream. I don't remember doing it, but I I heard myself scream. And then I just went limp. I don't remember feeling every one of those steps under my back and my head when I was going down. I remember being at the bottom of the stairs, and I remember seeing his feet going past and everything sounding like it was in an echo. And hearing every one of his footsteps echoing back through the house, out the front door. And then it's kind of a blur after that. I don't know if, I know the police didn't come, but I don't know if an ambulance came. I don't think they did. I think one of my neighbors heard me scream and came running. And then, then I was at the doctor's and they were checking me out. And I just remember being so afraid, not even for myself. Because I could take whatever injuries came to me physically, mentally. I knew I could get through it. But I was so afraid for my child, for my baby, that I had put them in a situation that they might not have survived. And that's how I remember feeling like I had put him in that situation, the most innocent thing in the world. I had put in the most dangerous situation. And. I remember being so afraid and so worried that I had, that that situation had done something to my child, had, to be quite frank, had killed my child. I was really, really afraid that what I was finally starting to get excited for was going to get ripped away from me in that split second because of that monster, that man that I had never seen before from that look in that eyes to the moment he dropped me down the stairs. How far along in the pregnancy were you at that time? I was, uh, I was just out of my first trimester, like end of first trimester, beginning of second. So three to four months, I want to say, I think I got pregnant in January and this occurred either the very end of March or the very beginning of April. I don't remember the exact date, but I was fairly early on in my pregnancy. But I do remember being out of the clear of, you know, just having a miscarriage. Usually at that point, it was like if something had happened, that's what they always warned me about was from this point on. You know, if something happens, that can cause it. But just a natural miscarriage was pretty much out of the question at that point. So I was really scared um, that that fall down the stairs had done that. I don't remember if if I had gone down solely on my back or if I had been flipping over onto my stomach, I don't think I did. I don't remember hitting my stomach or any part of the front of me. It was really like the back of my head, my shoulders. 
my arms. And is that what, what were your injuries as the doctor looked at you? I ended up just with a mild concussion, thank God. And other than that, just a lot of bumps and bruises. I was worried about my shoulders. I have um, notoriously bad shoulders. Those were th- those had come out, but they were just strains and sprains. And basically, told me if I had not just gone limp in that moment, then it would have been worse. Um, if I had tried to brace myself or tried to been uh, more rigid, then it would have been worse than it was. So. And you just went. I don't know why my body went limp. It's, that was just instant, instinctive. Then. It was instinct. Yeah, I. I remember my mom always telling me like the reason drug drivers don't get injured is because they're so limp in the car when they get into an accident. Um, so I don't know if that came into my mind when I was going down or if it was just purely instinct that let my body go because normally I'm very rigid and very uptight and I want to brace myself and so the fact that um, my body just kind of instinctively had instinctively gone limp was amazing. I. Bumps, bruises, and cuts, and a mild concussion. Could have been a lot worse. Was all I walked away with. Could have been a lot worse. Were your parents home at that time? They weren't. My dad was already at work. My dad always leaves for work really early in the morning. And my mom had just happened to be out at meet at a couple of meetings and running a couple of errands before she came home. So I just was by happenstance that I was there by myself. Usually in the morning when I would get up and get ready for school, I mean, at least my mom would still be there hustling and bustling. Um, and in thinking of it, so someone, your neighbor or whoever took you to the to the hospital, must have mm-hmm. told. How did your parents find out about what happened? My neighbors told them that they had taken taken me to the hospital, but I was the one who told them what happened. I was the one who. I just remember apologizing to them for letting that happen in their house. Um, I feel like I said sorry a lot more than I should have after the fact. But it was my first instinct was, I'm sorry that, you know, that I let this person come to our house before. I'm sorry that, you know, uh, he was able to remember ways to get into your house. I'm sorry that this happened in your house. Things like that. I feel, I just remember apologizing a lot. And I'm sorry that uh, I let myself get into the situation. <laughs> yeah, but you told. I'm really close with my dad. You, t- you yeah. told him all that when you didn't have any reason to believe you couldn't trust him, though. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's pre creep mode. So what? How did you proceed from here? What What happened after that? I mean, did he he just ran off, right? He ran off, and I didn't hear from him or speak to him again. And then, in talking to a friend, um, when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I decided the best thing going forward was definitely to get a restraining order, not only for myself, um, but for my child, for the father of my child, and my for my family. That was in the town, living in the same city as me, I felt like that was the only way I was going to be able to get away. Um, And at the time, I didn't really think about pressing charges because I wanted to kind of keep it under wraps. I didn't want... The town that I grew up in, it's a big city, but a small town, is what they always say. Word gets out really quickly around people that... And a lot of people who I went to high school with are still here or were still here at that time, people that I'd known since kindergarten, but families of people that we all knew for so long were all here. And I think my pride of, you know, letting people know that I was attacked took got the better of me. So I didn't tr- press formal charges of the attack, but I did get a restraining order against him. And I remember going in front of the judge and he, well, I remember getting the order and my friend served the order to him. We track. I don't even remember how we tracked him down. I think a mutual friend kind of did a setup for us where she told him, oh, like, let's meet here. And then he got served, but he punched, he tried to punch the the window out of my friend's car who served him the papers. Luckily I had a, a a guy friend serve him the papers as opposed to a girl. So he just drove off. He didn't even think anything of it, but I guess he tried to punch out his car window when that happened. And shortly after that, shortly before the actual court date, I got a text message from a number that I didn't know. And with every weary instinct in me, I opened it. And all it said was, this is Brian's friend. I don't remember his name. He wanted me to message you and ask you to drop the restraining order. Because it will, quote unquote, 
hurt his chances of getting a good job. And I just remember in all caps replying, he can go fuck himself. He should have fucking thought of that before he put his hands on me. You both can go to fucking hell. And I blocked the number. I didn't want any more. I'm not going to show you pity because you didn't show pity to me. I'm not going to show you kindness because you didn't show kindness to me, which sounds awful and petty. But at the same time, at that point, I just didn't care. I just wanted it to stop. I wanted it to be over. Well, it's not it's not so much that you're showing kindness even. It's that dropping the restraining order now means he can come near you and your family yeah. without any repercussions. And yes. that's, again, putting uh, yourselves yeah. back in danger again. Yes. And I remember being at the court date. He did not show up, which I feel like it speaks volumes that he didn't show up. He knew what he did was wrong. He knew that there was no chance. This was the court date to get the restraining order? Yes. He no showed to the court date. And it was a it was a female judge. And I remember her looking at me and saying, This is the easiest re- restraining order I've ever given. And that was it. And I remember feeling a weight lifted off my shoulders, but still sitting in the back of my mind was, Can he come back? You know, is he gonna still try? And then I believe the sheriff served him the actual restraining order. So I didn't have any contact with him. None of my friends had any contact with him after that. They took care of it from there. How have you done since then as far as your recovery from this? The rest of my pregnancy went really, really well. I was really lucky with that. I had no lasting side effects or symptoms that affected my pregnancy. My son was born um, in October of 2014 which was uh, about six months after the attack happened, six or seven. I can't do math, so. Um, but he was born uh, in October that same year. Beautiful, healthy baby boy. Um, and what's his name? His name is Tyler. Tyler. Um, he is now four years old, four and a half years old. He'll be five in October. And he is the absolute light of mine and my family's life. He is the reason that I push on every day. I definitely still have some PTSD type symptoms. Um, My anxiety is at an all-time high. I've had anxiety my whole life, but it's definitely been a little more on edge the last couple of years. The PTSD symptoms are the worst. My neighbor drives a motorcycle. My current boyfriend drives a motorcycle. And still just that sound of the engine idling. It pulls back some pretty dark memories, but... When those things happen, I just tell myself that it's not real anymore, that those are not the same, that these people that drive these motorcycles now, they're not the same person as that person who was doing it to me. They're not doing it with ill intent. They're not doing it out of hatred or spite. They're just living their life, and that's what I need to do as well. I can't let every sound of a motorcycle scare me anymore. But it definitely did for about maybe a year, year and a half after every sound of a motorcycle would make me jump, would make me cringe. I could be out in the middle of the day walking out of Target and hear a motorcycle and it would scare me. That seems to be the worst. Luckily, I don't have a fear of stairs. So, (laughs) But uh, yeah, the motorcycle sounds are definitely the worst. Every once in a while, they'll still still bring me back. And I just need to, every day I just fight to remember what I'm fighting for and who I was fighting for. It, it sounds like you've got a deliberate plan to, to handle that when it happens and to tell yourself and, and have positive self-talk and get through it. Definitely. Uh, like I said, I've had anxiety for most of my life. And so I've found ways to deal with it. And I've kind of applied those ways to deal with it to this as well. I, PTSD is like so crazy because you think of it like, you know, people coming back from war. My current boyfriend is an ex-Marine. And so he has a really bad. So I feel strange sometimes putting that label on it. But the honest truth is like, that's what it is. It's genuinely, it's genuinely post-traumatic stress because it was the worst day of my life. And I hope to never, ever live through something like that again. I hope to never be in that situation again. Have you heard from him at all since then? Every once in a while, I will get a weird Facebook request. I'll get a weird Instagram request. I'll get a weird 
Snapchat requests that have his name on it. Whether it's him or not, I don't know. I always block everything. All of my profiles are all set to private so that he can't even see anything on it. Especially not my son. I don't want him to even know what my son looks like. I don't, he doesn't deserve that. He may have, at one point, he might have been my consideration for Godfather at some point, but he doesn't deserve it anymore. But I do every once in a while get a weird friend request that I immediately, I immediately will block it, delete it, get it out. No more. How, how long is the restraining order in effect? Mine is in effect for five years. So actually this upcoming, actually, you know what? It's just about ending. Uh, I believe it ends in a couple of weeks. So do, do you just go to renew that? Yeah. So I can just go back to the court and just basically re-up it if I need to, um, which I probably will do just because I don't know exactly where he is right now. I don't know the status of his life and what he's doing. I don't really care to know. The only reason I wouldn't want to know is to um, make sure that he's not trying to find me again. But I think at this point, if he really wanted to find me, he would have shown up at the house again or he would have he would have found a way, I think, if he was going to. But I probably am just going to re-up it just for my own um, peace of mind to keep everybody covered and safe because it's just not worth it. It's not worth it if he can come back. I can tell you that would give some peace of mind to me and everyone hearing this story, too. Yeah. I hope you do that. Yeah, definitely. Ugh, it's just, yeah, it's too big of a risk, I think, to to let it be. Yeah. You credit your unborn son with saving your life that day. How did he do that? I think he, um, as much as it's, it's easy to to sit here and be like, well, this only happened because I got pregnant in the first place. At the same time, he gave me a reason to fight for my life that day. If it hadn't been for him, who knows? I'm sure I would have fought anyways, but I don't think I would have fought with the, the veracity that I fought with that day. I don't think I would have been brave enough to get physical back with him. I had kind of been in a dark place before I found out I was pregnant. You know, I was, my own life was kind of spiraling out of control. And so I give him the credit for saving me from that too, because he gave me something worth fighting for, something I could believe in, something I wanted to fight for, something that I wanted so badly that I wasn't going to let somebody take it from me. I had been pregnant before one time before that, and I had had a miscarriage pretty early on, and I remember that feeling, and I didn't ever want to feel that feeling again, and I wasn't going to let it happen, and I wasn't going to let him be the reason that it happened. I wasn't going to allow him the pleasure of creating my misery. I wasn't going to give him that chance, and so I knew I had to fight, and I had to fight for my son. I look at him every day and I hug him every day and I tell him thank you every day. And he doesn't understand why, but. Someday he'll know the story. Yeah. When I'm ready. <laughs> not for a while. Yeah. Not for a while. Right. Marina, I am, I'm so proud of you for uh, taking control of this situation. And I'm really glad that it turned out the way it did. Congratulations on being a mother and appreciate you sharing your story with us. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's the first time I've really told this story out loud. So I just want people to know that it's okay to fight. It's okay to do what you have to do to survive. You always have a reason. Thanks for listening to this episode. Every time I release a new show, I want to introduce you to people and stories that you just won't find on other podcasts. If you really like this podcast and want to make sure it keeps going, please consider supporting the show through our Patreon. You can do that at whatwasthatlike.com forward slash support for as little as $1 a month. I'm just getting this going now, and eventually I'll have different levels of support with different rewards and all that comes with it. Your support not only helps me cover the cost of creating and producing and hosting a show like this, it also tells me that you like the content. So once again, you can do that at whatwasthatlike.com slash support. We're on all the socials, so if you want to follow me or even contact me directly, 
All of that's on the website at whatwasthatlike.com. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you on the next episode where we'll once again ask the question, what was that like?